All right, let's get started. Should we get started? <laughs> Dude, the slap back in every room that I've been in this uh, weekend has been like totally crazy. Hey, was anybody at the concert last night? Cool, thanks for coming through. Uh, was anybody at the concert like when I was playing the changeover, like before the bands went on? And like all those lo fi beats were like. <laughs> I thought that was super cool, and I definitely want to produce a track that sounds like that on purpose. <laughs> all right, let me get all my stuff here. We're doing the slides uh, in Photoshop today <laughs> for some damn reason. Um, and uh, we're just going to see how it goes. Uh, I'm going to speed run a little bit. If you have questions, jot them down on your phone. And when I get to the bottom of the thing, um, you can ask me the questions. And if anything seems like super unclear out of the gate, like if I say something and you were like, what the hell is that? And you look next to you and the person next to you has that expression too, raise your hand right away because like I'm trying to like make sense. If that's cool. Um, I'm counting on you guys. I'm gonna record this. Hello. We're at the panel, everyone's having a good time. Uh, just thank you everybody for coming. I gotta get this set up. I had a friend who told me that um, and get speaking engagements at schools if your panels are good. So that's what we're doing now, we're filming it. And maybe I'll go to a school and give a similar talk. Because I truly believe that, there, that it is easier than ever um, for independent musicians and artists uh, to make a living with their art on the internet. Uh, we're really living in a golden age, I think, of independent creators. And we see it sort of at scale with massive YouTubers, folks who are making tons of money, making videos and stuff like that. But we're also seeing it more at the grassroots level, artists and musicians who are able to support themselves uh, by making their music and posting it online. Uh, there's one guy in particular that I think is a really great case study of how this works and how it can scale. It's an artist called Russ. He's one of the top 250 artists in the world right now on Spotify. And he got his start by posting a new rap song every week uh, through this old ass distributor called TuneCore. He did that for about two and a half years and built a following large enough that he secured a major label deal with Atlantic Records. And now he's one of the biggest stars in the world. And he did it by posting a song every week, which is the, which is the archetype that a lot of YouTubers use, uh, a lot of musicians use. And the idea is basically if you can continuously produce content, uh, whatever it is, you'll slowly grade a following, and you'll also slowly develop your skills. So consistency is really key, and I'm hoping in this panel, I'll give you some advice to hone in on what's gonna help you figure out your method, your way of creating content, so you can do this too if you like. Don't feel the pressure to do this every week. Just think about, you know, if you wanna be making art, you wanna be making music, uh, these are the kind of techniques that I've used to be able to make this my full-time living. I've been DJ Cutman for 10 years, almost to the day. I went to my first MAGFest 11 years ago, and it was that following year that I developed the DJ Cutman Project. And uh, it's really changed my entire life. And I'll tell you this embarrassing fact. The project was originally called DJ Airman because it was a beatbox project, because I did not know how to produce music. I was beatboxing over video game beats. And it was leading up to my very first show where I was like, I cannot do an hour-long beatbox set. I just can't. I booked a show, and I just can't do it. So I changed it to DJ Cutman when I realized I could take small cuts or chops of hip-hop beats and use those in place of my beatboxing. And if you dig through the Google image search results for DJ Cutman, you could find the original flyer where it says DJ Air with an X through it and hand-drawn in silver sharpie Cutman on it. And that was my very first show. So being able to adapt and do you know whatever works is really key. But let's talk about a little bit about the business of making music online and how I have sort of figured out this method that works for me both creatively and professionally. And I made my slides in Photoshop, so <laughs> I hope this works. First thing first, this might sound boring, but it's super critical, is to define your creative process. And that is not like I'm making beats or I'm drawing pictures, or you know, I'm making cosplay. It's the actual steps that you use to tangle wires. The actual steps you use in the process of making your stuff. So there are two main components of DJ Cutman. I produce music and I DJ. Those sound pretty similar, DJs and producers, a lot of people do both. But this, the actual methods are very quite different. So here's mine for producing music. Um, and this is what I do for every beat. I lay down my core idea, whether it's a video game sample, whether it's a bass line I play on the guitar, whether it's chords I play on the piano. 
Then I create the arrangement, the full structure of the song, whether it's two minutes, two and a half minutes, maybe it's a house track, maybe it's a trap beat. So once I have the core idea and the arrangement, I add detail, little flourishes, drum cymbals, sort of details like that. Yes, please go ahead, take pictures of this stuff. And if you take a picture and you can't read it, just like tweet me and I'll send you the card. Um, after the detail's been added, I mix and I master. Basically, I get the track sounding as good as I can. And then once all that's done, the song is done, and I move on to the next step, which is creating artwork and distributing it. Now, artwork sometimes can be uh, like a square piece of album art. It could be taken a, uh, with a photo from your phone. Uh, I've taken, I have an album artwork that's just a picture I took on my phone, and honestly, I was so happy with it because it's like a purely original work that took me 35 seconds and, uh, well, I don't know. I actually stand, stood in front of that bush for a while and took like a bunch of pictures. But then I got a nice picture of the bush and I made it my album art. Um, but you can also commission artwork from great artists. Uh, you can go on websites like unsplash.com and get free art and use that. Um, and then once the, or you can make a YouTube video, as the folks who were doing the panel before me said, or as many people do, uh, the artwork for their music are videos. Uh, and then the final step is distribute, which is uh, get that out. So back in the day, 2010 when I started, my only distribution platform was SoundCloud. I'd upload my music on SoundCloud. The art was like something I put together. And, uh, but this process was basically the same. I was laying down a core idea, arranging, adding detail, mixing and mastering, figuring out something visual, distributing it. Now I use platforms like DistroKid and SoundDrop to get my music on Spotify, iTunes, Amazon. And then I also make YouTube videos. So that's, that's my producing music workflow. But now when I'm DJing, like I did last night, it's completely different. I prepare my playlist. I decide which tracks I want to play. Since I was kind of thrown into this craziness of playing the different changeovers last night, I prepared, I prepared a set of over 300 songs just to like get ready for how much I was going to and what was I going to play. Um, so that's a big step for me. Then I analyze and organize the music. I test transition and kind of rehearse. Then I transport my gear and myself to the gig, and I perform. So you can see with these two things, oh, I have my old layer turned off. You can see there's really nothing on these two different things that people think are very similar that are the same. The process is completely different. DJing is not producing. You know, playing piano is not driving a Jeep down a mountain, you know? I mean, obviously, but as folks in front of a computer, in, in this day and age, sometimes it's, it's easy to lose track of that. So if you're feeling like, what the hell am I doing in front of the computer, which I think we all get that feeling sometimes, if you have your workflow written down, that can be a real guiding light. And I have a whiteboard that's like taped onto the wall in my studio, and uh, multiple times a day, every single week, I'm sitting there like, what the hell am I doing? And I look over, oh, I'm arranging. And I could go back to arranging. And it's, it's, it's been the single most powerful thing I have done moving from a casual creator to a professional, knowing precisely what it is that I'm doing. And you know, when you're making art, it's, it's easy to get tripped up. When you're DJing, if you don't transport yourself to the gig, that's kind of the end of the show. You're not DJing, obviously. But if you don't know that you have to mix and master, you don't realize you have to create artwork before you distribute, you can get held up and never, never get that music out. So it's helpful to get all that stuff. So let's talk about this fun word, appraisal, which is basically saying, what do you want from your art? What do you want from the process? And I labored over these two titles. They're not the best, casual and professional. We got filthy casuals who are just doing it for fun. We got hardcore professionals who are trying to make a living, trying to make their money. And um, this is less of like an appraisal of the person, you and me. It's more about the process and where we are. So going back to my producing, when I lay down my core idea, when I work on my arrangement, my detail and my mix, I'm very casual about it. I'm doing it for fun. Maybe I'll work for seven hours straight. Maybe I'll work for 25 minutes. Um, when I'm still in the flow of creating my music, my art, I'm doing it just for fun. I'm doing it to enjoy the process. But once that mix and master is done and the song is finished, it's professional mode for me. I got to find that art. And I try to do art in a single day. Like, wake up, we're doing art. We're finding that image. We're, get, we're getting a concept for the video. We're um, designing a template. We're going out and taking the picture of the bush. You know, we're doing whatever it is that we got to do. And then we're distributing it also. I try to do that in like a single sitting. And the reason being is any of these steps can have trip ups. 
you can lay down a core idea, start arranging it, and realize the core idea sucks. You know, and that happens a lot. I just had this big track on YouTube, uh, this remix of The Witcher theme. If you were at the show, you probably heard that song multiple times. People kept telling me to play it, so I kept playing it. Um, <laughs> and um, the core idea was a trap beat. What I wanted to do was throw a coin to your Witcher, trap beat. And when I started arranging it, it didn't work. It wasn't interesting enough to like, hold my focus. So I changed it into a club mix, and it all came together. And, but what that meant is I had to go back to that core idea and change it, and thus, the arrangement changed. Thus, I had to add new details. Thus, I had to redo the mix. So this is not just like the checklist. This is the order that I do things in. And that's what I think is really important, knowing the order, because you can look and say, well, yeah, what the hell am I doing on this laptop, or what the hell am I doing in front of this computer? Oh, I'm arranging, or oh, I'm adding detail. And that's only going to work out if that first step, your core idea, is good. Or like, you know, in DJing, if you're like at the gig, you can't like, if you're at home, you're like, what am I doing with my DJ career? It's like, oh, you're supposed to be at the gig half an hour ago. Like, that's pretty obvious. Um, so the, the appraisal of your goal, are you making art for fun? Are you trying to make money? If the answer is, I'm trying to make money, I'm trying to make this my career, what portion are you going to treat like it is a chore? Like, you got, you know, you're taking out the garbage, you take the garbage out of the can, you tie off the bag, you bring it down side, you put it in the can. Like, there's no flexibility there. You're not like, I'm going to take out the garbage, but I'm not going to take it out of the trash can. I'm going to throw the trash can out the window. It's like, no, that's not taking out the garbage. You know, if you don't distribute your music to a place where people can hear it, you're not really distributing the music. So again, it's important to be professional about some things, but you can be casual about others. And if you're just doing, if you're just making art to make art, it's okay to throw the rest of it by the wayside and just make art. You don't have to upload it if you don't want to. And I think that there is a pressure online for a lot of us to be a professional, to get a ton of plays, to make money, to get views. But if you have a career, or you're going to school, or you have a supportive family, and you just want to make art, I honestly believe the best artists on planet Earth are the people who are doing it for themselves, honestly and earnestly. So don't feel like there's a pressure to get views if truly you don't need that. Because I only started really hustling and grinding on getting plays, selling merch like I have in the back of the room, when I had to, when I lost my agency job. And I had to get gigs. I had to pay rent. And that's when I was like, well, I'm uploading all of these songs I'm not that happy with because I need to get paid. I need to get gigs. I need to get somebody on Bandcamp's got to give me $10 because I'm really hungry, like that kind of stuff. So sometimes that pressure can be helpful. But don't put it on yourself. You know, don't say, hey, I got to get, if I don't get 100,000 views on this next song, everything's ruined. You have a question? Am I confusing? What's up? We're going to do Q&A, but if there's something, let me know. We, I can hear you. Oops. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll get to that. That, I, that does tune, did tune core, does tune core suck? Yeah, it does. But it's not terrible. It's not the end of the world. We're going to get to the good distributors uh, in a little bit. Um, but my heart goes out to you. I have some albums on TuneCore too that I'm still paying $70 every year just because I have the account. So yeah, it happens. Um, but here, let's keep, let's keep moving and we'll get to the distribution thing. Um, leveling up. So I've been doing this for 10 years. And I was doing music before then, but DJ Cutman's 10 years, 10 years old. He's a big boy now. So, uh, and there's, and, and over my process, there's, gonna, there's places where I'm feeling like I'm kind of hitting the wall. Um, the, big, the big one for me was way before DJ Cutman. I was my freshman year in college, and I felt like I finally hit the ceiling on this program called GarageBand. This was my very first DAW. I was making music, loop-based music in GarageBand, and I felt like I really wanted to chop stuff up and make it edited, but there was no way to do that in GarageBand at the time. So I thought, how can I level up and expand what I'm doing? And the answer for me was to get a new DAW. I moved to this program called Reason, which was like totally different and totally crazy. But it was, it was a choice that I made when I had exhausted everything that was available to me. You know, in a, in a game, you level up when you get a certain number of experience points. You know, you kill a couple monsters, you get, enough, you get 100 experience points, you level up, maybe you learn a new spell, maybe you get a new ability. And I think producing and creating art is the same way. And again, I go back to the pressure we put on ourselves sort of as a culture uh, and as Americans. 
we want to be at a higher level than we are. I mean, it happens in games too, right? It's like, I, I can't think of a single game that I'm playing that I don't wish I was at a higher level than I am. But that's life, right? You have to level up before you can grow and build out. So with that in mind, don't hustle out to spend $5,000 on a press kit or something. I have made you this list that I call uh, things worth paying for. This I spent like so long, and I know that's the kind of silly list. This is what I think you guys should be focusing on. And Dia, yeah, go ahead and take a picture of it if you like. Um, when you're thinking about your art, you're thinking about your music. And again, uh, can I just get a sense, uh, who makes music in here? Oh, tight. Anybody doing visual art, cosplay, anything else? Okay, cool. So you're gonna see stuff, making games, that kind of stuff. Norman's up there. <laughs> uh, Frog's Tale, check it out. Sorry about the plug, but he's a good guy. He's a good frog. Um, you can replace the website, the music websites, with other art sites, you know? So, very first $20 you get, DistroKid. And if you're thinking, man, I'm just a hobby musician, I don't need to spend money on my, on my stuff, I just wanna make, I don't wanna spend $20 on a membership to a website to post my music, think about it like this. $20 is how much it costs for two and a half hours in a hotel room at this con. Every two and a half hours, you could have a new DistroKid account. So like, even if it feels like you don't want to spend any money, shrug that, get that impulse out of your head, drop the $20 on DistroKid to get started. Yeah? DistroKid is a very streamlined music distributor where basically you can upload your song with artwork and get it out on platforms like Spotify, Apple Music, YouTube, Google Play. You can do covers and you can also do play splits with your collaborators, which we're gonna talk about in a bit. So DistroKid uh, is a really great way to get you started for $20 getting music up on platforms, and then thus growing your audience. So once you have DistroKid, I highly recommend every musician spend 100 bucks on a Scarlet or some USB interface, so you're not plugging your headphones into your computer because just the general noise of the CPU, the RAM, the fans, all that stuff, you can't hear it through the headphones, but it's, it's affecting the sound quality. Right. I just got my Scarlet set, came with a mic, uh, that she would bring, and if you have a pair of headphones, then you can pay monthly for it. Oh, awesome. Paying out of pocket, like, the 200 Yeah, exactly. So, the yeah, so there are ways to get, and, and one thing I wanted to stress about this list is you might have some stuff on this list already. You might already have a PC that's handling production, that you, a game, any gaming PC can handle production. So maybe you already own your DAW or something like that. Maybe you have a friend who does photos, or maybe you're a photographer, you have a photographer in the family and you already have those headshots. So you, you check that off the list, but you should be, next time you're thinking, I wanna invest in my career, I wanna better my opportunities of, of success, Take a look at this list and see, do you have a USB interface? Do you have like a license to Photoshop to create uh, album art? Photoshop regular license is $9 a month now and it comes with all of Adobe fonts. So you get like 2,000 fonts and you get access to Photoshop on a monthly basis. And this, these are annual, this is annual. So it's $120 for the whole year. District kids, $20 for the whole year. So you, got a, you get $100 for Christmas or, or you know, your holidays. You wanna invest in your music career, get that interface, get that Photoshop license. If you have those things already, get a good pair of headphones or speakers. Uh, yeah? Photopia. So, so like these are what I recommend you spend money on, but as we're already learning from the other community members here is there are ways to, get, to not have to spend this money. But the tools themselves, I think, are worth it. And I, I came up working in a venue with a lot of live bands and there was this, such this stress on getting uh, press photos and getting music videos. Like I can't tell you how many great artists burn a whole year worth of money on a video that no one ever sees. And that's why it's at the very bottom of the list, number eight, music videos. Because yeah, if you're a YouTuber, you gotta be making your own videos, but if you're a rapper, you're a producer, you're a singer or guitar player, there, it's, gonna, it's very easy to find someone who's gonna take $1,000 from you to make a video, but are you gonna see a return on that comparable to having a good pair of headphones? 
comparable to having a USB interface so you can actually mix properly. So, De I'll give you the technical answer. Decoupling your headphone preamp from your computer's motherboard. Basically, it sounds better. Having the USB interface, it's going to sound cleaner. And with a cleaner sound, it's going to be easier to make decisions. Like, listen, you ever listen to like a song on your phone and it like doesn't sound good? And you listen to it in maybe one set of speakers, it sounds good, and then another set of speakers, it sounds like not so good. Like, you know that, that feeling? So when you have a USB interface, it's going to be more clear why it doesn't sound good. It's like, oh, there's a lot of rumbly bass garbage, or, there's a, or the highs really hurt my ears now that I'm realizing it, or something like that. And yeah, and you'll be able to get higher quality recording. But the main thing is, like, you, if you could buy a $200, $250 pair of headphones, but if you're plugging them into your laptop's headphone jack, you're getting like a $40, $50 sound. Yeah? Oh yeah, FL's great. Yeah. So if you already have your DAW, then that's great. And then like when you when you have your DAW, you have your headphones, maybe you want to buy some mixing plugins. I like things by Flab Filter and stuff like that. So basically that that's my order that I think in in order of both price but also importance. Like if you don't have a way to make art, you can't get your music out. I mean, I guess you could take pictures on your phone and upload that if you're comfortable, but like this is the tool set that I think gives you the ability to create art at a truly professional level that can compete with anything. Like, can you look at some major label artist, Ariana Grande's most recent album, the Thank You Next on it, is a goddamn Polaroid that is scanned. Like, that's the album art. So, like, even the major, major labels are doing these kind of fun, lo-fi kind of ways to do stuff. So, it's, but you got to have the tools. That's my opinion. Uh, let's talk about a little bit about collaboration, because it's important. And in a way, I kind of see that as what we're doing right here. We're collaborating. I'm showing you guys a little bit about how I do stuff, and um, oh, what is that? <laughs> That's what I meant to put up there. Um, I uh, again, I did this after my show last night. Um, ultimate rule of collaboration is the golden rule of humanity. It's treat people as you'd like to be treated. Not a lot of people follow this, but I feel like we all should, because when you treat people well, it allows them to do their best work, and when people are able to do their best work, the project turns out better. You also demonstrate like without saying it, that this is the way that we are interacting. You're setting up a framework of productivity and sort of getting, getting ahead of any potential problems. Vague kind of expectations uh, can really become expensive. And uh, so, let me see what I have. Oh no, where to go? I have, I have so many notes, oh my gosh. Raise your goal, casual, blah, 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 level up. There's the list, we did that. Expectations. I don't have a card for this. Expectations, basically saying, what do we expect from this project? Let's say I'm, I have another project called Bird Boy. Let's pretend Bird Boy is a different person. So I'm Cutman, over here is Bird Boy. Cutman and Bird Boy are collaborating on a song. Let's say Bird Boy is a flighty person, really wants the projects done and out as soon as possible so they can move on to the next thing. If the expectation that Bird Boy has is the moment the mix and art is done, it's out. And the expectation I have is, I have a, I'm going to MAGFest, I don't want a song dropping while I can't promote it, I'm going to do it in two weeks. If we don't talk about that, that could be a real source of conflict. Saying, I'm going to put this out in two weeks, Bird Boy wants it out yesterday. If we don't have that discussion, we only find out that we have very different expectations at the conflict point. When Bird Boy's like, why is the song not out? You know? So by, by being up front and knowing what you're doing before you start, you can avoid this stuff, and you can kind of reach a middle ground where everybody's happy. Um, I think, personally, it is, it's really great to compromise and sort of take your partner's uh, feedback into account and, and just do everything you possibly can for your collaborator because um, it, will in, it may not be the easiest way to get the project done, but it will influence the project in like this kind of holistic way and you'll grow as a producer and you'll grow as an artist by doing something you may not have done if you're doing it on your own. So Bird Boy wants to track out really soon, I want the track out next month, maybe we compromise by doing it in a week or two, and then maybe in a week or two, some bird blogger finds the song just by happenstance and posts it. That would have never happened if we did my plan and it probably wouldn't have worked out if we did Bird Boy's plan. So together we kind of have opened up a new opportunity. 
There's no way to predict that. But if, you have, if I were to have a fight with my alter ego, this is kind of weird. I wish I had a helmet or something here. Um, if, I, if we were to have like a confrontation trying to, we'll do it my way, no, we'll do it my way. One, we're wasting each other's life having a fight about art. And two, we're missing out on the potential opportunity of trying to do it Bird Boy's way. So I think it's really valuable when you're working with anybody if they say, hey, I want to do something this way that you're trying to say yes as much as possible, you know, as much as you can because you don't know how it's going to pan out. You could say in your head, and I've done this so many times, that I know how this is going to work out. This is going to be the perfect way to do it. And uh, I was wrong. The, my most popular songs are not my favorite songs. Like, just matter of fact. You don't know what's going to be a hit. And if you're working with somebody else who has a different idea about doing stuff and you're able to, I say go with it because you never know. Oh, there it is. Expectations. Set them. Don't forget them. We're going to release it in two weeks, okay? Yeah, sure. And then you do it. And that, boom, that's it. Um, let's talk about the tough one. I've never been to a panel at MagFest or at any con where they've talked really about money and how to deal with money. There's so much information for producers. I see people like, mm. I see, I, there's so much information online about how to make it as a musician, and it's full of outdated info, like, oh my god, I saw an Instagram post where it's like, the number one way musicians make money is touring. And I was like, yeah, in the 80s, like, are you kidding me? Um, so, but let's talk about money. And uh, I think, when I, when I collaborate with somebody, I try to almost always, I try to always do a 50-50 split. Even if I'm doing more work or I'm pulling more weight, if somebody has contributed a significant creative portion to a work I'm doing on, we're splitting the song right down the middle. And the reason being is that takes away the horrible step of negotiating cuts. And for me, I don't want to spend my time arguing with another artist about who's getting paid the amount of money. But a 50-50 split, or if there's four of us, a quarter share, everybody gets 25%, that works out really well. And then the decision is made. Because every confrontation, every kind of discussion is a potential for something to get tripped up. So, where is it? Um, so I think, it's to be, I think it's good to be clear and it's good to, uh, it's good to split things in the fairest way possible. And, and with the way I run game shops, um, it's, I try to give people, I told this in a panel a couple years ago, when I first started game shops, I was wondering how much to give the artist. I didn't want to give 50-50 because I've been on both sides of a 50-50 split. I've been on a management side when I worked at a studio, I've been on an artist side when I worked as an engineer, and 50-50, unless the project does great, but if it doesn't do great, 50-50 kind of sucks on both ends. Because the studio's like, this project didn't do good, and 50% is not a lot of money. And the artist said, this project didn't do good, 50% is not a lot of money. So when I started Game Chops, I looked up what major label iconic artists got as their splits, and I learned that Michael Jackson got 70%. And I was like, wow, Michael Jackson got 70%. That's probably because he's such a talent, he's so well known, I mean, rest in peace, um, that he, was, he, he got this cut because he knew no matter where he released, people were gonna listen to the new Michael Jackson record. So when I started Game Chops, that was the default split that I gave all my artists. I was like, everybody's Michael Jackson if they're on Game Chops. You know, everybody gets this, everybody gets this deal that where me as a label, I'm taking less than I would if I was a traditional indie label doing 50-50, but that forced me to build a label and a workflow where I can subsist off of a smaller percentage and then the artists, they get more to, you know, bolster their career. Maybe they're buying a new PC. Maybe they're ordering plugins. Maybe they're using it to fund a tour. You know, the way I look at it is if you're able to give more to your collaborator, that makes them better. And as they do better, that's going to feed back into the work you've done together, the song or whatever. Um, what amazing thing that we have as artists today is the ability to outsource the accounting using these two distributors, SoundDrop and DistroKid. We talked about DistroKid briefly. Both of these distributors allow you to say, hey, me and Bird Boy did this song, we want to split it 50-50. So somebody buys it for a dollar on iTunes, Bird Boy gets 50%, Cutman gets 50%. And the beauty of these sites, letting you split that automatically, DistroKid has a nice like, a feature where you can just like, input it on the site, a sound drop, you just email support and say, this is how I want it split, is that means nobody takes on like, the tax burden that typically you had to do when you worked with people just five years ago. When I first started Game Chops, we were running everything on Bandcamp. So from 2011 to 2014, everything was on Bandcamp. And every month, I would look at the stats, I would have a text document or a piece of paper where I would write down everybody's 
how much everybody's albums or songs sold, I would divide by 70%, and then I would PayPal. Every, I mean, the money came in from Bandcamp to PayPal, and then I would PayPal everybody the amount they're owed, down to the penny, every single month. And that was working until 2014, when the IRS sent me this little letter saying, hey, we see from your PayPal records that you made $40,000 this year. And I was like, no, I didn't. I mean, like barely crossed the poverty line in 2014. But PayPal sent the IRS a document saying everything that came in was my money. Even though I wasn't putting it into my bank account, I had unknowingly taken on this big tax liability. And I wasn't writing it off because I thought, hey, I was not putting it into my bank account. PayPal should know that money's just going back out. But they didn't. And as a result, Gabe Chups almost died in 2014. I got a, I think it was twelve dollars or $15,000 tax bill. More money than I had ever seen in my life. Saying, you owe more money than you basically made in the past two years to the IRS right now. And, it's earning, and, and that amount is earning interest right now. So um, I hired an accountant. And he kind of saved my ass. He reduced it to 2000 I didn't think I should have owed anything because I like paid my taxes, what I thought was right. But simply by receiving someone else's money, I had taken on this liability. And um, it took me like two years to just pay off that, those two grand uh, back to the IRS. But I was able to do it, thankfully, by folks like you listening to my music, coming out to shows, and buying more stuff on Bandcamp. So like for the whole year after that IRS letter, I was, uh, I was taking all new sales and giving it to the government. It's a little tough, but um, then DistroKid, Sounddrop, and formerly Louder, a Sounddrop is the guys who took over Louder, by the way, for any of the old school kids who used to use that site. Um, all, of the, all of the revenue is split, and now I get paid from DistroKid, I get paid from Sounddrop, and I don't have to worry, and I can just file my taxes like a normal dude, like DistroKid and Sounddrop, they send me my tax form and that's it, and I don't get... I don't take on this extra liability. And more importantly, I mean, I'm a pretty detail-oriented person. I paid everybody every month. But you don't want to be holding your buddy's money. Like, you just don't. I mean, I certainly don't anymore. You don't want to be responsible for having someone else's cash and having to pay them back. So having a dis being able to outsource your accounting with stuff like this is really, really great. Yeah. Uh, so both DistroKid and Sounddrop, which is why I recommend them, uh, have cover song licensing, which is where we do something. So we're going to have to super grind on this panel because I didn't bring my MacBook charger. So this is speedrun part two. Uh, <laughs> I got like four hours of sleep. They had me at the main stage for like four hours uh, yesterday. It was pretty wild. Where are we? We're in the money thing. So there, there's my basic thoughts about money. And I, th I hope you noticed here is that it wasn't like a squirrely talk. It wasn't like, eh, I'm trying to buy a Lambo or whatever. It's a very practical thing that applies to $10,000 or $10. If you're able to outsource this amount, this, this stuff to someone else, it frees you up to make art and it takes away the kind of, this whole extra liability that used to like, basically lock people like us out of having an independent music career. Yeah? Are you USB-C? Oh, rip. Oh, thank you for, thank you for trying. Uh, okay. Oh, let's talk about schedule. Haste makes waste. Do not just put your shit out as soon as possible unless you are truly just casual about it, and that's what's important to you. If you're trying to make a career, you're trying to earn some money, it super, super benefits you to upload your music and have a week or two before it comes out. Be, reason being is sites like Spotify and Apple Music use that time to queue you up an algorithmic playlist to promote your music. Um, Spotify, this is a little bit of insider info, Spotify needs to receive your music by Sunday if you're going to appear on next Friday's release radar. So if you can't get your, sat, your track out to, in SoundCloud, in Spotify's hands by Sunday, you should wait a whole other week before posting it out. Or else you don't get the algorithmic traffic, which for Game Chops and for DJ Cutman, it's like 80% of our first week traffic. This actually, this is, these are some sad numbers, but I'll tell you. We, had a song, we usually have a song come out uh, on Fridays, which is when Release Radar pops up on Spotify. And I wake up about 9 in the morning on Friday, and I check my app, my Spotify app, when we have a new release date. And we usually have about 1,000 plays by 9 a.m., which is pretty freaking awesome, if you ask me. But if we, we just had a track come out on New Year's Day on Tuesday, and that track had like 14 plays by 9 a.m. Reason being is nobody had seen it because the platform had not started promoting it yet. 
So, it ri so that's the, we're talking about like a hundred times the audience potential by just being a little patient and setting a schedule. So um, yeah, it's really, really worth it. Like again, if money's not your thing at all, go ahead and put it out. But if you are trying to build your audience, you're trying to build a career and live off of royalties, having a little bit of time, and then you have a whole week to be like, I have a song coming out. And that might feel silly to like make a mention, hey, I have a song coming out, please wait for it. And I don't know if you guys are on YouTube, people hate that. I mean, not everybody, but some people hate seeing that. It's not here yet, what the heck? Just post it, you idiot. Like, yeah, people do that, but like, it's so worth weathering that little storm to, with, for the potential to be, to be appreciated and promoted by the platform that you're on. Talking about collaboration a little bit. This is something that I had to learn the hard way like a lot, particularly when I was younger. Appraising the team, not in talent, because that's like our natural thing, right? As artists, we're thinking about, oh, so-and-so is so good at blank, and oh, I'm so good at this, and I'm such a great bass player, I'm such a, such a great producer, such a great mixer. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about literally who's got more experience doing the thing. Who do what now? Like for example, I got a buddy called Electric Dave, and he's a great drummer, and he's been playing drums since middle school. I make a lot of trap beats. I've been making trap beats for about 10 years. Dave's been playing the drums for 22 years. So if I work with Dave on a song, and he's got a thought about the drums, even though I'm confident in my trap beats, even though I'm feeling good about my production, because, and this is my personal belief, because Dave has more time invested, higher level experience on that drum track, if he's got a problem with the drums, I'm gonna put my own opinion aside and listen to him. And the reason being is that's the only real objective way to do it. Because like, I can feel like I am a better mixer or a more talented producer than him, and I can feel like he is a better drum player than him, and I can make up a thousand reasons why his experience does not apply to me. But the truth, and I found this, the one thing when, it, when you strip it all away, the one thing that holds true is how long people have been doing stuff. Like, talent aside, skills aside, there's something that really just comes with doing something for 10 years, for 20 years. And I think if you learn to respect that with collaborators of all ages, I'm working with an artist who is about to turn, no joke, 14 years old. He's 14 years old, but he's been playing piano since he was four. So here's a kid who has 10, who's 14 years old, responds to me on Instagram with like three letter messages, um, but he's got 10 years of piano experience. I have two years of piano experience. So while I think I'm an adult, 34 years old, I'm learning piano as an adult, I've been making music now for almost 20 years, but like if little Jonas says, I don't think that chord is right, or I don't think that vibe is right on this thing, let me replay it, I'm gonna listen. And, it's, and my ego says, he's a kid, you do what you want. But when I, fit, when I strip that away, when I take a moment, I'm like, Jonas knows the piano better than I do. And it takes a moment to take a break and think about, all right, who's, what's the real appraisal? Like, you know, it takes a, you're playing an RPG or an MMO, you gotta look and see somebody's level. You don't just like know it right away. And sometimes in real life, you gotta do that too. You gotta take a moment and be like, wait a minute, does this person actually have more experience with this than me? And if they do, I say 100% of the time you should lean on them. I mean, yeah, creatively, sometimes it's weird, but honestly, the, I feel the people who have more experience generally make better calls. So that's something to think about. One thing to think about also, and I can't stress this enough, the goal of any project is finishing the project. So if there is ever any time when you're working with somebody on something and they say, no, I can't do this, you need to treat that like you just got a flat tire on your car. You gotta get out of the, you gotta get out of whatever you're in, you gotta address that flat tire. Because yeah, you could drive on it and ruin your car, you know? You may, you'll probably never make it to the garage if you keep driving. So if you're working with a collaborator or even on yourself and you're feeling like, man, I cannot do this anymore. This drum track is weird. This bass is weird. This piano feels, I don't feel good working on this. I gotta tell you, so much of those feelings are misleading. And if you get up and you walk away and take a lap and you come back, you'll feel different and that problem will look different too. There's a lot of pressure on us as producers to like stay in front of the computer and finish stuff. But you can burn out and ruin songs. I think a lot of us have experienced like overworking our art and kind of ruining it. So, especially when you're working together, but also when you're working with yourself. If you get a hard no, if you get like a, I can't do this anymore, 
it's, you're going to feel like, I should throw my hands up, screw this, what a waste. But what I recommend you do is think about, okay, we can't do this piano track, we can't do this drum track with Jonas, sir, we can't do this drum track with Dave. What can we do to get this song done? Maybe I can put that trap beat back in. Hey, Dave, can I put the trap beat back in since we can't get this drum thing worked out? Yeah, man, do it. Oh, it's awesome. There you go, now the track's done. But my impulse was like, well, screw you then. You know, and you, you can feel it in the back of your head. Well, you say no, well, then I'll say no. And then, uh, and then that, that's how everyone loses. Honestly, I should have wrote this on the board. Uh, the only time you lose in music is when you quit. That's it. That's the only way you lose. So if you're feeling something's coming up in a production that's making you want to quit, the answer is not to blame whatever made you feel that way. The answer is to take a step back, look at the project, go back to that list, that process, where is it? And man, this is so hard on two screens. Uh, <laughs> I really didn't want to learn PowerPoint. I thought this was gonna be a better idea. <laughs> you go back to the list and you see, hey, where are we? Where are we stuck? Oh, we're stuck on the mix and master because that drum track doesn't sound right. Okay, well, cool. Well, if Dave's not feeling good about doing drums on this track and it's not sounding right, maybe I can finish the mix and master some other way. But if you don't have this list, that feels like it's just like over, right? So going back to the very first thing I said, knowing that process is, is really important and um, paying attention. Don't, you know, as artists, I think there's a lot of like trust your feelings. And as Americans too, we're really big on like our feelings being like the guiding light. But in truth, our feelings are so circumstantial. Like I can't tell you how many times I've worked with an artist who we've hit a roadblock and gotten a flat tire and we've talked it out and at the end of the talk, they say something like, yeah, my cat died. It's like, oh shit, man, well, I'm sorry. Why did we have a fight about the drum track for an hour when you're sad about your cat? Why don't we just take a load off? You know, why don't we just take a break? So when you start to feel intensely, and I got a card about this somewhere in this giant Photoshop document. Um, it's, really worth, uh, it's really worth taking a break and looking at the list and seeing where you are and when you get that hard no, think about, all right, what does this track need to be finished? Not, what should it have been, you know? It's easy to get attached. So let's see, we did this, we did this. This was such a bad idea doing it in Photoshop, by the way. <laughs> I like felt so clever, I was like, oh, this is gonna be awesome. And like two, three hours in, I had to like cut a whole chunk of my panel and I have all these layers. Oh, here's a nice thought. Types of collaborators, automotive and dependent. And I find that people can get in one of two of these modes, either want to do something sort of all automatically on their own or want to do something with a lot of feedback and back and forth. Dependent or collaborative um, is like the traditional music, musicians in the studio, musicians in a band, sounding off each other and, and sort of growing and making decisions all the time together. But a lot of people on the internet, myself included, would much rather be left to their own devices to sort of build out and build up on their own. And it's really important to assess when you're working with somebody else and when you're working for yourself, what mode are they in and what mode are you in? Because if you're both dependent, that's great. If you're both feeling automatic, that's great too. But if somebody is really dependent on feedback and somebody else is really dependent on being left alone, that, that'll grind to a halt. And if I can identify, hey, I need to be left alone right now, or if they can identify, hey, I need some feedback on this, this project's kind of hard, and, and we can facilitate that and come and provide our collaborator with our need, that's gonna help the project get done, and you'll be doing that very important thing, which is providing for the person you're working with. It's so critical stuff, so it's important to take a, take a note of what mode you get in and what mode your uh, collaborators do. Um, I almost cut this from the panel, but it's really important. A navigating conflict. And if this is the last thing I talk about, I think it's kind of the most important. I've been doing this for 10 years, and um, even before that I was doing art. And it's, it's easy when things, we've talked about a little bit in this panel where things go wrong, expectations are not met, and you get in a conflict with your creator, with, with your collaborator, or in some way. And um, my basic takeaway from all my time of doing this is that big moods are dangerous. When you start feeling very intensely, that can be really exciting and can really gas you up, but it also kind of blinds you to what is actually going on in that list that we looked at at the very beginning of the panel. 
we're mixing right now, but I'm getting like super juiced up. And it's very easy. My dad has this. My dad has this saying that like, I thought I was really dumb when he told it to me as a kid, but I think about it more and more as an adult, is that love and hate are the same things, just different flavors. This high level, intense emotion. You could, and I've seen it, particularly with musicians and artists, where you can go from super enthusiastic and super into something to super against it and like, what the hell am I doing? And again, our ego, ourselves, want to say that our feelings are the most important thing that we got to listen to. It. If I'm feeling bad in this collaborative relationship, it's because I can't collaborate with this person because I can't do this project. But in truth, there's probably something going on. Maybe your cat didn't die. Maybe you're just having a bad day. Maybe you haven't eaten lunch. Maybe you didn't get a lot of sleep last night. Like there's all these things and none of those, I promise you, none of those are gonna be in your head when you're feeling really intense. You're feeling really intense, there's no way, you're gonna be, oh, I wonder if I got enough sleep last night, let me check my sleep tracker on my smartwatch. It's like, no, that's not what's gonna happen. You're gonna say, I feel bad and I might lash out, or I feel bad, I might recede. So when you start feeling really intense or you notice your collaborators start feeling intense, I think it's important to talk about your feelings, but goodness sakes, keep those conversations brief. Because when you're in an environment where you can escalate emotions, it gets kind of dangerous. So, so here's my little list. Set our expectation of how to navigate conflict. There it is. Burp, 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 burp. Photoshop panel, Photoshop panel. Set expectations early and update regularly. What are we doing? What do we expect? Compromise whenever possible. This is my no divas rule, which is now an official Game Chops rule no divas, basically saying nobody gets the final say. We could talk about a anything, but if somebody is completely uncompromising, it's, that's a red flag and we need to reassess how we're moving forward. If somebody has gotten to a state where they're feeling like diva that they can't compromise at all, that is a state, not like a condition of the project. And it needs to be addressed like something, like as if they were sick or tired or needed a breast. Um, Keep emotional conversations brief. Yes, it's cool to talk about your feelings. I'm open, I like to talk about my feelings too. But when you're still working on the project, remember the main goal of a project is finishing the project. And I promise you, as somebody who worked in a collaborative music and animation studio in college and out of studio, and in college and out of college, we spent so much time talking about our feelings and all I can think about now as an adult, like 15 years out, is what would we have gotten done if we were working during that time instead of talking? Because I don't remember what we talked about. I remember we talked for four hours and then we got pizza. Like, I remember that, but like, it was just a bunch of dudes gassing each other up. This is my first studio job. And um, it's easy to get into that, but like, if you can recognize it, just like, keep it brief. Somebody's talking about their feelings, let them talk about their feelings, but be receptive, not reactive. You can hear them. You can understand, oh, Bird Boy's really stressed out because he really wants this new tune out. He hasn't uploaded it in three months. I'm sorry, Bird Boy, you're stressed out. I want it out in a month. Let's put it out in two weeks. But we can't put it out sooner than that because we need those algorithmic playlists, dude. And he can be like, oh, okay, I understand. But if we talk for an hour about him being upset about that, there's like no way I'm gonna reach that rational conclusion at the end of that hour. I mean, it's possible, but highly unlikely. The more we talk about our feelings, the more intense they get. At least that's been my experience. So keep our emotional conversations brief. And if your collaborator, your partner, your friend, family member has to vent or something, receive that information and be support. But do everything in your power not to react to it, to get mad, to have so much empathy that you get upset too, which I'm, I'm totally, I totally do. But uh, yeah, it's worth thinking about. And lastly, I see a lot of bullshit information on Instagram about finding collaborators and like, you gotta reach out, you gotta DM a thousand producers. That's what I, I saw that shit on Instagram. DM, challenge for this year, DM a thousand producers in 2020. It's like, screw off, man. Nobody is, nobody is, I had one guy DM me a string of hashtags. I was like, dude, the hashtag, it's a DM, there's nothing to do in this hashtag stuff. But this is a quote that I came up with and uh, I'm really happy with it. When we help someone else, we become valuable ourselves. So when you are looking for a new collaborator or somebody to work with, you should be thinking not what they can do for you. Oh, it'd be awesome if Gary V would retweet this panel recording and like blow me up. But like, Gary's not gonna do that because Gary's working, you know? 
Dead Mouse isn't gonna like fly me out to his studio to make a track because he's busy. But I can help my friends here at the con by telling them, you know, my collaboration philosophy. I can help out other artists by mastering their track and releasing it on my label. I can provide value to other people and thus I become valuable. So if you're looking to collaborate with somebody, the number one question you need to be asking is what can I do for someone else? Maybe you can rap and you'll do it for free. Maybe you can make beats and you'll let them know. And um, we got, I just got the 10 minute sign. So uh, yeah, that's important to think about. Um, I'm gonna breeze through this one because this one is also something that I see on Instagram very wrongly. And this is real info, I did the numbers. You don't have to worry about looking at the numbers, but boom. This is how I pay rent, in this order. Spotify and music platforms is number one. Anyone who's saying Spotify doesn't pay their artists is full of shit, honestly. You ever get a, I don't know. Patreon, crowdfunding supported. Patreon was the, th the platform that helped me go when my job, when I lost my job, my uh, agency job, Patreon was allowing me to do my podcast and pay rent for four or five years. So crowdfunding and finding a fan base. YouTube, uploading videos. It was a real lifeblood for us uh, as Game Chops, but uh, it's another music platform comparable to Spotify and how much they pay out. And people say, oh, YouTube sucks because blank, 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 blank. And like, yeah, everything is sucks if you're looking for stuff that sucks. Like, true. Oh, but the copyright. Oh, but this thing. It's like, yeah, but you can go outside and fall down the stairs and break your legs. You're not going to be like, oh, fuck stairs, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and that's kind of what what happens. So don't listen to this stuff. This is, this is how your boycott man is paying the rent. Spotify, Patreon, YouTube. And number four is commissions and contract work. I know some people where commissions and contract work are number one and everything else falls that. So you might have a different spread. Number five is Bandcamp, which is direct sale to fans. Twitch and live streams. Live shows and merch. There's that. That's pretty down there on the list, right? That at a time was higher up. But for me right now, I'm doing much better on Spotify, Patreon, and YouTube uh, than I do. Uh, at live shows, but I will say that buying merch from Axe at a show is, I think, the best way to support Axe. Um, it's the best way to support Axe. They don't have to go home with merch, and um, you're, you're able to buy the merchandise without paying for shipping, without having to go through a label, without getting extra cuts. And, plug, got some merch in the back. We got vinyls for $20 too, so that's marked down if you want to help out. Um, SoundCloud has monetization now, so maybe. I got like $30 last month, so that's like, yes, sandwiches. I don't know how, like, how thirsty you guys are, but I only ever eat half a sandwich because I found out that actually half a sandwich is still a sandwich. Did you, know, did you realize that? So I'll go out and buy a sandwich and I eat half of it, and then like, later I have another sandwich. Um, so th that's, that's some hardcore grind there. Um, all right, pro tips. Uh, oh, no, first, how often do I release new art? Every week if you can. If you can't do every week, do every two to three weeks. That's a hard rule. There's like no talking about it. If you cannot get out track out every month, you're not going to get traction. You're just, I don't know. How, you could be the best in the world, but the way that platforms are set up right now, you're not going to get traction if you cannot hit every month. And everybody I know who has blown up is hitting it every week. Uh, the big YouTubers, uh, artists like Russ I talked about earlier, uh, my good friend Charlie, CG5, he went from 400 subscribers when we started working together, has been doing a track every week for now four years. He's at 700,000 subscribers. And when you do a track every week and you're churning them out, yeah, maybe not all of them are as great as you had hoped, but you get better and the next one's better and you build it into your life and you build it into your habit and that really, that really pays off. So how often do you release art? Try to hit every week, if you can't, every two to three weeks, if you want to build momentum. And if you're still learning and you're still grinding, that's fine. Uh, pro tips. I don't even remember what's in this section, um, but let's go through it. Oh, that's a good one. Oh my gosh, I wish I could broadcast this over the PA system. Try something yourself before asking for help. Holy shit, I, when I figured out that I could save money by not doing commissions and gain new skills and also it was cooler because I did it. It was like completely life changing. I was commissioning art, spending thousands of dollars of art for game shops every year. And I found this website Unsplash, which is like a free photography website. And I realized I could start making art myself. It was cool and custom because I made it. I was getting photos for free and then I wasn't waiting on commissions and stuff. It was like totally life changing. 
Everything takes longer than you expect. It goes back to the schedule thing. Just like, you're like, oh, I could do this in an hour. Guess what? You could do it in two days. My Witcher remix, I was like, oh, I'm going to be able to knock this out of the park in like 90 minutes. It's like, yeah, 90 minutes for like five straight days. All right, batteries get low. What else do we have here? Oh my goodness, this one's so important too. Listen to your audience. It is as important as them listening to you. I have seen artists with wicked talent and awesome skills. And if, if you're not paying attention to what your audience is telling you they want, they, they, you, you won't connect. It is, it, it is a reciprocal relationship now that we're on the internet. You have to, if somebody responds, hey, we love your Zelda me music. I mean, the three vinyls we have in the back. Our response, because Zelda and Chill did so well, people said more, more, more. And we said, okay, let's try a different genre. We did Synthwave with Mario and Chill. And that connected, but not as strongly. It was a different scene. So now this different scene found out about our Chill thing, and then we went back to Lo-Fi with our Pokemon and Chill album. And everybody who was like, yes, that's what we're looking for. So we tried something, got a different reaction. We went back and refined and tried again, got an even bigger reaction. And now this is our strongest series Game Chops has ever had. And it became, and it's from me listening and reading the comments and seeing what people actually want. Oh, here. And this one's really important. Uh, all artists learn this. Some take their whole damn life to figure it out. I have figured it out really in the past few years is that pursue detail in your work, but don't try to make it perfect because you won't. You won't. Yeah, do you know that like, if you look down in a really deep microscope at really subatomic particles and like really small stuff, it kind of looks like galaxies and planets and like the universe. And I always was fascinated how the really, really small stuff also looks like the really, really big stuff. Because in a way, both of those things are so far away. The tiny molecule in my fingernail is as inaccessible as like galaxies and planets far off. So if you're trying to get perfection and you just keep getting closer and closer and closer and closer, you're never going to get to the bottom in art or in life. So figure out what details you need in your work and pursue those. Don't try to make it perfect. Just try to get it done. Oh, and here is my thesis, my final thesis. And this is also a hard one that I put it up on the screen by itself. And my laptop's going to die and then we're going to be out of time, but I'll try to take one or two questions. Here it is. You ready? Don't, don't take this one lightly. It's really serious, okay? You don't have to like your art for it to be enjoyed. So that artistic, ego-driven thing in the back of your head saying, ah, oh, I hate this trap beat. What the hell was I thinking? It doesn't really matter, truthfully. It doesn't matter at the end of the day. Whether you're a professional artist or a casual artist, if you don't like it, that doesn't mean that everyone else is not going to like it. And I have some songs that did so well that I th I'm hyper embarrassed of. Has anyone heard my song, Boat Dog? That shit is a damn travesty. I had the flu when I made that song, and when I listen to it, I think about having the flu. But that was my first song on Spotify to reach a million plays. And you wanna know why I reached a million plays? It's because I posted it, even though I didn't really like it. So that's my panel. Thank you everybody for coming. We got merch in the back.